Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to our time of, of Bible study uh, this Thursday evening at Little Hill Church. Uh, my name is Joshua Rowe, uh, and I'll be uh, leading us for this part uh, this evening. Uh, let's begin uh, by reading uh, from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, and we're going to read from verse 9. So Matthew, chapter 9, and verse 9. Please turn to that uh, in your Bible if you have it. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 9. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your sinner eat with uh, your teacher? Sorry, eat with tax collectors and sinners. But when he heard it, he said, "Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, and not sacrifice. For I came to call, uh, not to call the righteous, but sinners." Well, let's pray uh, before we come uh, and look at this passage. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this account uh, of the salvation of this man, Matthew. We thank you for the fact uh, that you called him and that you saved him. We thank you for that uh, we too, uh, though we are sinners, can be saved uh, by the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that if we're be believers here this evening, uh, that we have uh, met with the person uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that we have been changed, uh, that we have been saved. And Lord, I pray for any here this evening, or perhaps who are watching, who don't know the Lord for themselves, uh, would, uh, even as they look at this man Matthew uh, and his life, uh, would they see that there is salvation for them too, uh, through what Christ has done, uh, through his death and his resurrection. And we pray that you'd help us uh, by your Holy Spirit as we study this this evening, uh, and that we'd all be uh, encouraged uh, and built up in our faith, uh, by what we hear. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, have this account open in front of you, please. Uh, this uh, is really the only uh, significant account that we read about Matthew in the New Testament. Uh, he's listed in uh, all of those places where the twelve apostles are listed, uh, and we read about this story of his conversion here in Matthew 9, and that's about it. The account is replicated in the Gospels of Mark and Luke, and both of them are fairly similar, almost identical, to what's written here. Uh, the most significant difference uh, is that the name Levi is used in those two other accounts. And they don't say specifically that Matthew and Levi are the same person, but it's clear from the context that the stories are the same, uh, so therefore we can tell uh, for certain that these are uh, the same, Matthew and Levi. And it wasn't uncommon uh, for people at the time to take on different names. Think of Simon Peter or Paul, who was Saul. Well, here we have Matthew Levi. I'll try to stick to Matthew uh, for the rest of this evening. So what can we learn from this short account of the life uh, of the Apostle Matthew, of this small section of his life? Well, firstly, we see that Matthew was a sinner. Matthew was a sinner. In verse 9, we see that Jesus meets him sitting at his tax booth. Now, that's not to say that tax collecting is a sin. I don't think any of us like the fact that we have to pay tax. But I think we all recognise and understand, at least on some level, that we need to pay some tax to, for certain things uh, in our society to function. And so Matthew wasn't a sinner specifically because of his profession. But unfortunately, the entire system of tax collecting in the Roman Empire was corrupt. I'm sure this is something that many of us uh, know already, but I'm going to just briefly uh, recap for those that don't. Uh, the Roman authorities demanded a certain level of tax uh, from the people. But tax collectors were permitted to charge what they wanted on top of that uh, for their own pocket. Uh, and it seemed that this uh, principle uh, and this right was almost universally exploited. Uh, for the benefit of the, of the tax collector. Uh, they'd extort money even out of the very poorest people uh, and they'd line their own pockets with it. 
And because of the fact that the government allowed this, uh, there wasn't anybody that you could complain to. You couldn't take them to some kind of court. It, no, you just had to deal with it uh, and pay up. And if you couldn't afford to pay up, uh, then you could be left destitute. So these tax collectors, uh, they really were truly uh, wicked people. Uh, they were consciously ruining people's lives and livelihoods for their own benefit. Uh, so it's no surprise uh, that later when Jesus tells a parable and wants to use an illustration of the worst kind of sinner, he picks a tax collector. And tax collectors, they were hated in Jewish society at the time. Uh, they were hated for what they did and hated for who they did it for. Uh, they betrayed their own people, the Jews, by swindling them, but they betrayed them doubly uh, by continuing their oppression uh, under the Romans. Uh, part of the reason for the Romans uh, sort of levying this high tax uh, was that so nobody uh, in the empire, no nation, could become wealthy enough and rise up and rebel. And the Israelites, their desire was for freedom, so no doubt they would have seen the tax collectors as part of their means of enslavement. No wonder they were hated. So Matthew, he would have been rich, but he would have been hated. And we see some evidence of that down in verse 10. He doesn't seem to have any shortage of money. He's able to put on this feast for Jesus and his disciples. Uh, that's not stated clearly that it's him in this account, but the other two accounts make it clear that he's the one that's put this on. It's at his house. And we can see uh, the resentment. You can almost hear it in the Pharisees' voices uh, when they say uh, in verse 11, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And Matthew, he was one of these sinners. But he wasn't just a sinner. He was a sinner who was called. A sinner who was called. Uh, Jesus sees him in verse 9 and he says to him, follow me. And uh, Matthew does. It seems uh, almost so sudden, so immediate. I think these days perhaps we've become so used to so-called friendship evangelism uh, that we forget that sometimes the conversion of sinners can be instantaneous upon their encounter uh, with the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Matthew, he knew he was a sinner, and Jesus knew Matthew was a sinner, but he was the sinner who he had come to call. See what Jesus says in verse 13, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Now it's important for us to clarify what Jesus is saying here. He's not saying that there are some people who aren't sinners, that there's two categories, uh, the righteous who don't need to be called uh, and the sinners who, who they do need salvation. The Apostle Paul uh, makes this clear where he says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But Christ here, he's making the distinction between those who know they are sinners uh, and know that they need salvation and those who believe that they are righteous because of their own works. And this makes sense. It's consistent uh, with what Christ uh, has been teaching all through the gospel. Uh, Jesus came preaching a message of repentance and faith. Uh, and repentance begins with sorrow for sin. Uh, and you can only be sorry for your sin if you know you are a sinner. But Christ here, he's also turning around the accusation of the Pharisees upon themselves. Uh, they say in verse 11, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But if they'd understood what a sinner really meant, then they would realise that they could just substitute this word uh, for the word people. Why does your uh, teacher eat with people? They'd redefined the word sinner, you see, to mean a particular group of especially bad people. A group in which they were not included. They were righteous. They'd made sinners a group of people who they thought that God would certainly never accept. And we can be like that sometimes too, can't we? We can write off certain people and assume God won't save them. Well, of course he'll say to us, we're uh, well-behaved, uh, law-abiding citizens. But that drug dealer, uh, that pro-abortion activist, uh, that imam, he wouldn't save them, would he? 
But Christ turns all of that on its head here. He comes not to the Pharisees, the good religious people, uh, not particularly uh, does he come uh, to the rich or the rulers, but most of the people he comes to are the poor, the despised, the crippled, the rejected. He calls tax collectors, prostitutes, Samaritans, and yet very few of the Pharisees are called. Their pride and their arrogance prevents them from humbling themselves before Christ. Uh, their love isn't for God, but for rules and for ritual. That's why Christ uh, quotes this passage to them in, in verse 13. Uh, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And he asks them to go and learn what it means. He's quoting uh, from Hosea chapter 6, a, a passage from the scriptures which the Pharisees claim to be experts in. And yet he's using it to condemn them. In the original passage, Hosea, he's condemning the Israelites uh, who were continuing to obey outwardly uh, by sacrificing to God, uh, but at the same time worshipping other gods. And the point that he was making uh, to the Israelites at that time is that the most important thing is our heart and our relationship with God. Uh, and without that, all this religious practice, the sacrifices, were empty and meaningless. And now Christ takes that and he applies it to the Pharisees. They couldn't understand uh, why Jesus would call a sinner like Matthew. Because uh, they didn't realise and understand their own need to be in a right relationship with God. But Matthew, he understood. He knew he was a sinner. He knew he needed salvation, and when he was called, he responded immediately with repentance and faith. He experienced firsthand uh, that mercy that God desires, the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Matthew, he was a sinner. Uh, he was a sinner who was called, but finally he was a sinner who was changed. You see, when we're saved, we're saved immediately and definitely. Uh, but then begins a long process of changing us to suit our new nature. If we're to use the, the correct jargon, I suppose, we begin a process of sanctification. Uh, some things uh, do change immediately, uh, but other things change gradually. Uh, and we see some of that uh, reflected here. Uh, there's some things in Matthew's life that change instantly and immediately when he's saved. We see in verse 9, he rose and followed him. He leaves behind his job, instantly it seems. And now, again, that's not to say that tax collecting was intrinsically sinful, if somebody could do it perhaps without being involved in the corruption of that system. But he knows that Christ has other things for him. Uh, the follow me uh, that we have in this instance, it's not just spiritually follow him, but physical. Uh, Matthew is going to begin his new life accompanying the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and he now begins to use his wealth differently, uh, not just uh, for his own benefits and for his pleasures, uh, but to serve the Lord. And he puts on this feast for Jesus and for his disciples. It's a feast where Jesus can conduct his ministry, where he can meet with those who need to hear the gospel. And I suppose this is an experience that's common to many of us. When we are saved, there are some things that change quite suddenly. We realise that in our new lives as followers of Jesus, there are certain things we can't do anymore. Uh, certain places that we mustn't go anymore, uh, but certain ways uh, in which we may start looking to serve the Lord uh, with what we have and the gifts that we've been given. But that doesn't mean that we become immediately different and changed. Uh, there are parts of our old nature that may take many years to pass away, uh, and some of which may never truly leave us uh, until we're ultimately sanctified when we meet the Lord face to face. And I'm sure this was also true of Matthew. Uh, we don't see many individual mentions of Matthew apart from in this passage. But we can learn things about what his life was like uh, by uh, following on in other parts of scripture where the apostles are mentioned uh, as a collective. 
Uh, For the apostles, including Matthew, sanctification was a long process. There were times when they doubted, times when they didn't understand, times even when they abandoned the Lord. Mark chapter 9, it's almost like a catalogue of the disciples' many failings. Uh, Firstly, they fail to be able to cast out an evil spirit. Uh, Then they fail to understand what Jesus uh, is saying when he foretells his death and resurrection, Uh, even when his uh, words are very plain and clear. Uh, And then after that, uh, they argue and bicker about who is going to be the greatest. But even in those failings, they're being sanctified. When they fail to cast out the demon, Christ teaches them the lesson of prayer. They maybe don't learn anything immediately uh, from failing to understand uh, Christ uh, foretelling his death and resurrection. But later they would understand. And they would learn from that that God is sovereign and that he keeps his promises. And when they argue about greatness, Christ teaches them the lesson of humility. Even in their sins and in their difficulties, God was changing Matthew and the other apostles. And the same is true of us. Even when we sin, when we fail, when we go through times of hardship, God is sanctifying us. That isn't to say that we should seek these things out. But through these times, we are being refined. The Apostle Peter uh, says this in his first letter. uh, Now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So our struggles, uh, they have an ultimate purpose that we may better honour, glorify. And praise God. And Matthew, he was changed. He may have abandoned Christ in Gethsemane, but he returned. He was restored. And then he was sent out by Christ. And he went on to become a part of the leadership of the early church. Christian tradition holds the fact that Matthew would go on to be martyred for his faith. But we don't know that for certain. The scripture doesn't tell us. But we do know that all of the apostles were willing to die for their faith. And what a transformation in Matthew. From the man who defrauded and swindled, now being willing to put his life on the line for the gospel. And isn't that how we would want to be remembered as believers? We may not face death for our beliefs, but our country is becoming increasingly less free for Christian worship. We may face uh, the loss of jobs, we may face fines, we may face imprisonment. But my prayer is, like Matthew, we may see that this is all worth it for the sake of following the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, there's one last point I want us to note before we close. This passage that we've read, it's autobiographical. Uh, This book is inspired uh, by the Holy Spirit, but it's written down by the very Matthew that we're reading of. Uh, He likely wrote this book uh, sometime in the mid-first century. Uh, But it would have been based on notes uh, that he was taking uh, all through his time accompanying Jesus. He would have likely learned his skills uh, in writing uh, as a part of his training to be a tax collector. But now he was using those skills and gifts Uh, to the glory of God. Well, my hope uh, and prayer for us is that we would want to serve God uh, like this man, uh, the Apostle Matthew, Uh, that we'd want to use our gifts as he did, uh, like this man. Uh, He was a sinner, but he was called and he was changed uh, by his encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ.